Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Thirsty for the Word Thursday, where tonight we're going to be talking about leadership matters. Um, this title is kind of a play on words. Um, I was because if you're looking at leadership matters, like issues dealing with leadership, but also I want you to understand how much leadership actually matters. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so uh, we're going to do some d dives into what leadership is, what leadership isn't, and then we're going to focus on a folk on a on a particular scripture. Um, I would say this before we get started. When we get to talk, I want you to be talk about leadership, even good leadership or bad leadership that you've experienced. Uh, but um, let's uh, change the names or <laughs> to protect the innocent or guilty <laughs> for later on. Okay, so I would I would advise you that if you had a leadership issue, speak in general terms instead of um, specifics. Okay. Can we do that? Amen. All right. Um, Cause we're recording this and this is going on the internet and it's going to live forever. And so we don't want to, uh, we won't cause no drama. All right, let's get started. All right. So here's what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to look at, we're going to define what leadership is. Um, we're going to look at, we're going to look at two different, defi two different leadership definitions. We're going to look at leadership in general. We're also going to look at the definition of servant leadership because in the church, the type of leadership we should be exercising and um, presenting is servant leadership, okay? okay. Um, we're going to look at good and bad leadership in both the world and the church, and we're going to talk about why leadership is so important. Uh, and I'm going to, and then we're going to look at an example of leadership, of a leadership issue, and we're going to kind of break that down, okay? So before we get started, have you ever worked for a bad leader? or was under bad leadership? Sure. Yes. Yes, I'm pretty Lots sure. Lots of times. Yeah. And so we're gonna talk about kind of, the reason why I wanted to do this is because sometimes, sometimes we understand that stuff is bad, but sometimes we don't know how to define why it's bad. And that's why we're gonna look at some of this. And plus, um, for those of us who are in leadership, it's always good to review what leadership is and question your own self. Am I a good leader? Am I leading well? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Uh, no time in leadership that I think you ever should get to the point where you think you know it all. <laughs> There's Amen. always stuff to learn. There's always different techniques to learn. And it's okay. And I think a sign of a good leader is to be able to look yourself in the face, look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, I messed up on that one or this is something I can do better. Okay. Leadership is that important. All right, let's talk about it. We're going to look at our definition of leadership. Okay. Can somebody read this definition for leadership for us? This is the world's definition of leadership. And well, just regular definition of leadership. Can somebody read those one of those, those definitions for us? The actions of leading a group of people. Okay. The state or position of being a leader. Mm -hmm. A leader is one who inspires and motivate actions. Mm -hmm. Translate vision into reality. Now, for me personally, the last two definitions are the ones to me that really stand out. Uh, the, I got this. Uh, I got these a lot of these from the internet, and the cup, the first couple ones were like very generic. But a leader is one who inspires and motivates action. Okay, you are not a leader just because they put you in a position. Mm -hmm. You're a leader when you can inspire the people under you to grow and do better. Okay. One of the challenges in our church and as soon as somebody shows a wee bit of talent, we want to push them up to be a leader, but we often don't take the time to teach them what it means to be a leader. We just think we get to boss people around, right? Leadership is not about bossing people around. It's inspiring people to action, right? And the last definition which was the one that uh, I think, especially in the church, we really need to look at it's translating vision into reality. You're not a leader unless you have a vision or someplace you're trying to get to, okay? I always tell people my job as a pastor is to get the people from where they are now to where God wants them to be, right? Sometimes that's difficult because people, you know, people get comfortable. People like what they like. They want to stay where they are. But the job of a leader 
is to move people from where they are to where the Lord is trying to take them. And it might not be physically. Sometimes it's physically. Sometimes uh, one of my friends, um, he had to, he, he took over as the pastor's congregation. He had to get them into a building. So he had to physically move them from where they were to another spot. But sometimes, but the biggest challenge, I think, is to get people mindset wise from where they are to where they need to be. Now, that's a hard one. Uh, because many of us, we are comfortable where we are. All right. Any questions about these definitions of leadership? Comments? Nothing? Okay. All right. Now, we're going to look at servant leadership. Somebody read the definition for servant leadership for us. Putting the needs of others first and helping to develop and perform as highly as possible, empowering and uplifting those who work for them. All right. Notice the difference between the other definition and servant leadership. Servant leadership is about putting the organization or the team even before yourself. So I first experienced servant leadership, I would probably say in uh, high school. I was in JROTC. And, you know, they give you your position or whatever. But your job, even then, was to make sure the team does what they're supposed to do. Especially when you, then when I joined the Army, it was even more intense. If there were people under you, your job was to ensure that your troops had everything that they needed, right? Traditionally, you didn't even eat before your troops ate because you want to make sure they were taken care of. And the, the thing they would always tell us is if you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. OK, mm -hmm. so servant leadership is all about not uh, so much servant leadership is, is, is about not so much um, about you being uh, taken care of, but it's taking care of other people. This is the style of leadership we should be practicing in the church. If you look at Jesus life, he was about servant leadership. Right. Remember uh, when uh, they were on the boat and the boat was sailing and what they come to Jesus and say, don't you care that we're going to, we're not going to, we're going to drown. Did Jesus let them drown? No, he got up out of his sleep. I would have been mad wiping his eye and like, peace be still. So we have to understand if we are in the church and we have a leadership position, this is the style of leadership we should be leading with. Okay. Our job is to uplift those who we work for. Okay. My job as the senior pastor here in my head is for all the pastors under me to be able to take a better, take my spot one of these days, or for them to go off and get appointed to churches and be successful. They're not competition. It's I invest in them. They invest into the kingdom. We all win. The challenge is we, a lot of leaders don't look at it that way. To, I was always told you're not a good leader unless there's people who can step right in and fulfill your spot if something were to happen, right? That's what good leadership does. You ensure, um, my mom used to have this saying, y'all might have said it too, y'all might have heard it too, one monkey don't stop no show. I've heard it. <laughs> and so that expression is something as a leader you need to keep in mind. As a leader, especially a servant leader, you need to make sure that the people that are under you have what they need to be successful. And you should want them to be successful. Even if their success, quote unquote, outshines yours, okay? I look at my pastor. He invested in me, didn't see me as competition, saw me as an, saw me saw me as um potential right and the same thing yeah. i want to invest in those up under me i hope you know I'll, if it don't have it may, it's not saying it's happening tomorrow or anything but i hope that every pastor that has served with me or under me has gone on to do bigger and better things and they are better pastors because of my leadership that's what servant leadership is all about you want to uplift those who work for you okay any questions, comments about servant leadership? All right. All right. What makes a good leader? Mm, let's look at this. 
All right. So I kind of put these two together. So we got what makes a good leader on the left, what makes a bad leader on the right. And so how about this? Uh, who, uh, let's see, Reverend Daphne Brown, will you take the left side and Reverend Dauphine Parrish, will you take the right side um, and just uh, read them off for us? So let's do the good side. Let's do the bad side first. Come on, Reverend Parrish. Not saying you're a bad leader, but, you know, I'm picking on you. <laughs> oh, I'm bad because I wish I had all the class leaders with me. Okay. All right, go ahead. The bad mm. is conflict avoidance. Mm. All right, let's pause. I guess we're just going to walk through this. Okay. Why, why do you think conflict avoidance is bad leadership? Because it's going to keep happening over and over and over. Bad leaders avoid conflict. Conflict is going to happen in the church, okay? Especially the church. I mean, this is even the world, but I want you to look at this one. Keep going. I'm sorry. I will, maybe we won't go through all of them, but if we mm -hmm. see, if I see one, we'll stop. Go ahead. Lack of flexibility. Mm -hmm. My way or the highway mindset. Mm -hmm. mm. Rational, rationally. That's probably rationalizing. Rationing it's supposed to be or, rationalizing. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Poor or unethical conduct. I'm zooming in and out. I'm on the phone. You're good. <clears throat> lack of a track record. Mm. I'm going to pause right there for a second. Okay. You can't just turn it on once you get into the big chair. Okay. Mm. You have to be doing it before you even get there. Right. Mm -hmm. You need to be, if you want to, let's use, for example, you want to be a presiding elder, right? You got to have to be doing the, th the same skills that you're, that you would need as a presiding elder as a pastor or vice versa. It doesn't just kick on once you get to get the appointment, okay? Mm. All right, continue on. <clears throat> Inability to create or conform to a company culture. Right. Poor communication skills. Self-centered. All right. That's a bad leader. Yeah, that's a bad leader, okay? <laughs> All right, Reverend Daphne Brown, do the good side. All right, the good leader says, says a good leader has integrity. Mm -hmm. They are able to delegate. All right, pause right there. You, good leadership is not you doing everything, <laughs> right? Okay. You have to be willing to share the responsibility. One of the signs of a good leader is being able to share information because information is power, right? You want to be yeah. able to share information. All right, continue on, sorry. Mm. All right, communication, mm -hmm. learning, agility, empathy, uh, yep. courage, and respect. All right, so that's the world's definition. Any questions, anything jump out to you in this list? Uh, something uh, not necessarily that jumped out at me, but I was looking for but I guess in terms of resource management, you know, uh, yeah. delegate, communicate, learning of, of, of ability, empathy, courage, respect, integrity, and uh, a lot of leaders don't have the skill set to manage the resources. Mm. All right, let me let me not push back. Let me ask a question to that. What is your greatest resource as a leader? Openness. The ability to ask for help. Your greatest resource. Mm. Your people. Your people. There you go. Be. There you go. Your people. That's where a lot of leaders mess up. They think it's about making sure they hit the quota, making sure if you take care of your people. Everything else falls into place, right? Especially, especially in the church, right? I tell people all the time, I have never seen a church doing what they're supposed to be doing, worrying about finances or resources. That stuff will find you almost. As long as you do it, like as you're taking care of the people. What happens to a lot of pastors is you'd have been to going all these conferences for all these years, and then when you finally get the appointment, oh, they gonna these church gonna take care of me. <laughs> Don't act like we ain't heard to see it. But your people, no matter if you're in the secular world or in the church world, your people are your absolute greatest asset. 
Now, that does mean sometimes if you have somebody who's not pulling their weight, you have to either try to coach them up, you know, build them up. But if that doesn't work, eventually you got to let that person because that that's hindering. That's going to hinder your growth. Right. You're not managing your resources well if you have to wrestle with that. All right. Anybody else? Anything else? Thanks, Reverend uh, Williams. Go ahead. I have something, Ray. On this, the, what you just said, mm -hmm. that's why a person who doesn't have conflict, avoid, who can't, who likes to avoid conflict, mm -hmm. uh, who who isn't flexible, can't mm -hmm. help that person that's lagging behind. Mm. But they don't want to approach them. You know, you got somebody who's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but you don't want to you don't like conflict so so you don't mess with them and you don't you're not able to lead them you're not able to boost them up because right. you you don't want any kind of conflict yeah so let me say yeah. this I, can i add to that part about conflict yeah. pastor mm -hmm. um if you are a leader who avoids conflict mm -hmm. um to me i see it as a leader or as someone that thinks, because you know, sometimes conflict is good because you can learn from the people that you lead. It doesn't mean just because you are a leader that you know it all and good leaders know that they don't know it all. There is a thing called healthy conflict. So if you're constantly avoiding conflict, you're closing a door of opportunity where the leader and the two they lead could grow and learn from each other, or maybe even learn from their mistakes. Because um, I think that conflict is unavoidable, but there are ways that it can be handled. So mm -hmm. a good leader should be able not only to just not avoid conflict, but should be able to handle or be able to have the skills to do conflict resolution. Amen. All right. Uh, I know Reverend Parrish asked where the encouragement is. Let's look at the second list and then we'll see if it's, oh, Lord, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's look at uh, let's look at this. I thought I saw Reverend Rayco Brown. Are you on here? Yes. Okay, will you do the right side? That's the bad side. And uh, I'm gonna pick on Reverend Williams to do the other side, okay? Okay. So All right. We'll do the, yeah. Do the right side first. We'll do. We'll start with the bad and with the good. The right side. Yeah. Really demonstrate the fruit of the spirit. All right. Hold on. And before you start this list, these this list on the right side, I borrowed this from Tom Rayner. This is the traits of a of a toxic leader. So if you don't know Tom Rayner, he's like a big time church um, consultant. All right. Sorry, Reverend Rico. Go ahead. Okay, uh, seek minimum structural accountability. Mm. Accept, uh, expect behaviors from others they wouldn't expect from themselves. Mm. They, uh, they, everyone as inferior to themselves show favoritism. Do not allow for pushback. Self-absorb. All right. Have any of you encountered anyone in the church that has demonstrated any of these? Yes. <laughs> Which ones? Which ones? Favoritism, pushback, mm -hmm. the whole list. No, I'm just kidding. Uh... <laughs> Do you understand why these traits are bad, especially in the church? I think that the, the top of the list demonstrates it. Mm. Rarely demonstrate the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So and everything else under that, yes, it, I, I'm just saying I agree with Reverend Williams that um, the top one is probably well the top one, um, and everything under that is a result of not mm -hmm. demonstrating the fruit of the spirit. Right. Why do you think, I, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. Can I take that a little further? Go ahead. Because I've actually had to deal with some conflict not too long ago, and that's what came out of it, is that sometimes when people don't recognize 
or and or understand people's gifts, then they have a more apt to discredit them, disrespect them, because they themselves don't understand. And that's why it's important not just to know your own spiritual gift, but to understand the gifts, period, and how they operate so that we can encourage, build up, lift up instead of tear down. Right. All right. Can you, do you guys see how these traits um, can be, why these traits are so detrimental, especially to the church? Yes. So, um, especially the, okay, so if you watch, if you'll watch, toxic leaders, the, the number one thing they try to do is they want minimal structural accountability. They don't want people to be able to speak into their lives. So I'm mm -hmm. the reason why I'm bringing this up is in case you encounter this in other places, you understand what's going on, okay? Leaders who are toxic don't want you, don't want, have, don't want to have a lot of people having accountability over them, right? Good leaders are not afraid of accountability. They embrace it because they understand accountability is what helps us grow, mm -hmm. right? So they usually, what they try to do, and this is how they usually how the process works. They come into an organization, they come into the church, right? And, oh, pastor, we usually do this at this time. We usually do that at that time. No, 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 we're not gonna do that. I I'll tell y'all what I wanna do, right? Do I that. want to limit the amount of accountability you have to me. Hey, I need you guys to be here at, <laughs> I need you guys to be here at 11. And they come strolling in at 11 15. Right? They, they, they look down at their nose at people, right? Oh, they ain't better than me. You know, they usually find two or three people in the church to kind of pull them to their side. So they're like defending them for everything, right? And shun everybody else. And then when you try to bring up some kind of pushback or some kind of, I don't think this is right, first thing they say is, oh, I want to hear about that. And they're totally full of themselves. So be careful, even of yourself, to fall into this trap, right? All right. All right. Rev Williams, let's do the other side. Yes. Seeks God's direction. Modest. A peacemaker. All right, let me pause right there. What's it, going back to we're talking about avoiding conflict? Good leaders in the church are peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Let me explain the difference. Peacekeepers do whatever it takes just to get by, right? Oh, don't you know? Let's not let's not argue. Let's you know let's just let's let's avoid that subject. We, oh, we don't want to deal with that. We don't want to make anybody mad. Those are peace makers i mean peacekeepers peacemakers are kind of like i hear your side i hear your side all right we're gonna do this all right let's go forward okay um those of you who are parents right if you see your kid fighting over a toy what do you usually do teach him to share remove the toy <laughs> <laughs> remove the toy right uh -huh. get to the root of it <laughs> It's then you're going to learn to share or you're going to do it out. Right. Yep. Sorry. We got two parents on here that CPS is looking for us, but that's okay. <laughs> Bina! Bina! Uh, Lord, help us. Help us. But you got to understand one of the challenges we have in the church is too many peacekeepers and not enough peacemakers. And here's what I mean. If you have somebody in the church that's causing problems, just saying, oh, leave them alone, that you're being a peacekeeper. Sometimes it's good for us to go and confront that person and say, hey, you're, you're, you're being disruptive. You're not demonstrating the fruits of the spirit. We need you to rein that in. That's biblical. You can go read the Bible and it tells you, if you have an ought with your brother to do what? Go and talk to them, right? If they won't listen, you're supposed to do what? Bring somebody else in to help kind of mediate. <laughs> if they still won't listen, you're supposed to bring a couple more people in to try to mediate. The whole goal is to make peace, okay? And peacekeeping and peacemaking is not the same. And so one of the one of the areas where, where we, we tend to want to just be peacekeepers is, and I'm about to step on some toes, and I'm sorry, but it's usually with the singers in the church who've been in the church forever. 
because since they were there forever, we don't want to make Sister Johnson bad. She's been in this church 415 years, and her, you know, her great granddaddy uh, signed, you know, signed the uh, the stuff over. Okay, but you cannot allow her to continue tearing down the church because you're hindering your growth going forward, right? They need to be, if they've been in the church that long, they should be displaying what? Some fruits of the spirit. Okay. I don't, you know, so we have to be willing to talk to people, not just the young people, because we quickly do that, right? You see some young person cutting up, hey, hey, cut that out. We have to have that same spirit when it comes to everybody. Now, listen, we need to be respectful, right? And I get that. But we we cannot avoid conflict on the grounds of just because somebody's been in the church forever because it tends to end up hurting the church long-term, right? Um, one of the churches I pastored, uh, I asked them, how did the church get in this decrepit state? And they said there were two or three families in the church who paid all the bills. <laughs> and so everybody would just kowtow and do whatever they told them to do because they paid all the bills. You know, the money they gave was kept the church going, right? Even the pastor, he wouldn't say that to them because... And he said they would just run the church the way they saw fit because they gave all the money. Those people went on to glory. That church was left with like a very, very small group of people. And so they ran off new people. They ran off the young people. And so it was just left with a small group of older folks there. So... On the one hand, you're just trying, you know, we want to make sure we got all our bills and all the other stuff covered. You hindered your growth from the future trying to appease to some people for now, right? So I under so we have to be willing to make peace. All right, I'm sorry, uh, Rem Williams. I got on my soapbox. Keep going. Sorry. Okay. The next one, fair and just. Mm -hmm. Surround themselves with honest and trustworthy counsel. All right. Let me pause right there again. If you're a leader... No matter what level you are, you need to have people who are around you who are honest and trustworthy. We're going to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not, sometimes. <laughs> okay. We, you, you can't get to, you, can't, you don't want to put yourself in a bubble where can't nobody tell you anything. Okay. Sometimes people see stuff different than you, and it could be something that's helpful for your benefit. Okay. All right. Keep going. A learner, humble, kind, Slow to anger. All right. So let me pause for a second. Is there anything, first off, that you think is missing from either one of these lists? Um, for the for the one that we're working on right now, I would say good leaders grow other leaders. Yeah. Like I said, this, this is not an exhaustive list, but that's a good one. That's really good one. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Any Anything else you see that you think should be on here? No, the slow to anger covers the patience, which is important, but you know, you can exhaust patience and that's when you have to deal <laughs> yeah. with the situation, yeah. you know, don't mm -hmm. avoid. So yeah, that's good. Um, okay. All right. Um, I don't think innovation. It seems like to me uh -huh. that, or did I miss it somewhere? I, I don't, yeah. it seems like to me, you need to, you need to be innovative. Yes. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Mm, very good. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. All right. Um, the one that says a learner. Understand education. You don't have to. You don't. All of us are don't probably not going to have to get go to seminary or get formal education. But you do need to read. You do need to uh, seek other people to help you learn better stuff. Right. I mm -hmm. surround, I try to surround myself with smart people. So hopefully some of their smartness rub off on me, <laughs> on me, right? I find people who I think are further down the road than I am and try to learn from them and glean from them. If I can find out a senior pastor that's doing something decent, I want to learn, teach me. I'm, you know, a learner doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't always mean formal education, but formal education is good. I'm not knocking from, I'm, I'm saying, but if you can't get formal education, learn any way you can. If it's reading books, if it's listening to podcasts, if it's, um, you know, uh, one of the best ways to me is finding somebody who's already doing what you're doing and sitting under them and humbling yourself and learning from them and gleaning from them. 
I like hanging around older preachers because they give me wisdom. <laughs> They've been through this stuff before. Um, uh, when I was in San Diego, uh, there was a preacher. Her name is Reverend Annie Watson. And uh, Sister Annie is the, I think she's in her 80s. But every time I call her, what's going on at church? They being nice to you? <laughs> I'm like, yes, ma'am. They being nice. Okay. Uh, you know, but I got this going on. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's what you do. Blah, 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 blah. I had the same issue. And this woman's done, she's done this. She's retired from the, you know, she was, <laughs> she's done this. So I'm listening to what she's saying because I'm, you know, she's done it and she was effective at it. And so, I always try to find somebody who's a little bit ahead of where you're going and, and try to learn and humble yourself. There's, there's nothing wrong with being a learner. And if you could get formal education, go do it. That's not, that's never a bad thing, right? It's never a bad thing to have education. All right. Uh, one more I would like to add go is uh, good skill of the resilience. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there's a book um, for those of you who like to read by a lady named Angela Duckworth entitled Grit. Um, and it's legit about I mean, grit, sticking to it. Um, one of the things as a good leader you have to have is grit. You have to be resilient um, because problems are gonna pop up and you gotta learn how to just you know figure it out. Uh, I remember being in the army, if they told you to do something, you just gotta figure it out. <laughs> one way or another. But thank you, Reverend Breco. That's a good one. Resilience. It's a real good one. Okay. Why is leadership so important? All right. Somebody read this quote from John Maxwell. Everything rises and falls with leadership. That's perfect. I'm glad y'all did the unison. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everything rises and falls with leadership. Okay. If you bring me, if you show me a church, where things are down, the first place I'm gonna look is who's in charge. And, re and look what I said, who's in charge? Who's in charge isn't always the pastor because I know how some churches operate. <laughs> Sometimes uh, as, my, as my one colleague used to call them, those cane tappers <laughs> are the ones who are actually in charge, okay? So remember, everything rises and falls with leadership. So if St. Mark is not doing what I think it should be doing, I don't look at anybody else. I look at myself first. What am I doing wrong? If the bishop placed me here to be the leader, where am I falling short? One of the things that a good leader does is they hold themselves accountable. Okay? you got to hold yourself accountable. All right. But that's a good quote from John Maxwell. Everything rises and falls with leadership. All right. We talked about all that, but now we got to look at the Bible. Okay. We're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam. This is a, a very, I mean, it's familiar to me, but it's a pretty interesting bit of text about leadership. Okay. We're at 1 Kings 12, 1 Kings chapter number 12. Uh, if somebody wants to read for us the first five verses, please. Rehoboam went to Shechem. I'm reading from the NIV. That's fine. For all Israel had gone to gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, go away from thee, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. All right. So Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Solomon has died. He's taken over the kingdom, okay? 
And so he's faced with his first major leadership decision. Now, for those of you Bible scholars, I know what you're going to say. Just hold on to it, okay? <laughs> we'll get there at the end, all right? But Rehoboam's getting his first test as a leader. Now, when you first assume a leadership position, you're going to be tested right off the bat, whether by the Lord or by your people. They're going to try you. <laughs> right for lack of a better words they're going to test you to see what kind of leader you are to test your metal to see how you're going to handle the situation how you handle a lot of times your first major test as a leader is how people are going to follow you okay and so Rehoboam goes to Shechem Shechem kind of was the place that where I mean so he goes to Shechem to be made king right and so the people come to him and said, hey, because you remember Solomon did a lot of building projects while he was alive. He built a palace for himself. He built the temple. Uh, he had all these gardens and stuff. He really worked the people to really build up uh, Egypt. No, I'm sorry, Egypt, Jerusalem, right? And so the people were saying, hey, lighten the yoke, lighten the yoke, lighten the yoke, right? And what did they, they say? If you lighten the yoke, we will serve you, okay? Now, Think back to what we were talking about with leadership as far as servant leadership. Let's see what Rehoboam does. All right, let's continue on. All right, go ahead. Somebody read for us six and seven, please. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Now, listen. Now, what does that sound like to you? Verse number seven. Appeasing the people. It's, yeah, close. What style of leadership does that sound like in verse number seven? Servant leadership, right? He said, look what he says. If today you will be the servant to the people and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants, right? As you serve your people, they'll be able to take care of what you, they'll be able to take care of you, okay? The, these advisors of Solomon who've been walking with Solomon all this time, what kind of advice do you, what kind of advice is, are they giving uh, young Rehoboam here? Is this Positive. solid advice? Yeah, is this solid advice? With John? Yes. Okay. So he's getting this from Solomon's senior people. All right, let's see what else we got. <laughs> let's read verse number, verses 8 through 11, somebody. Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him mm. and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? Verse 10, the young man who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Mm. All right. So what leadership problems do you already see with young Rehoboam? Uh, rejecting spiritual advice? That's a good one. Any other things mm -hmm. you see that he's doing that's probably not that's demonstrating bad leadership? He tried to use his power to control people. Good one, good one, good one. Anything else you see? He's surrounding himself with the S people. Yeah. Good one, good one. Okay, anything else? So, I... I uh, I don't really want to tackle verse number 10. I'm going to leave that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, if you're a Bible scholar, you understand why verse 10 is kind of 
little, little risque. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, that was it. I, you get what I'm saying, Reverend Go. Y'all get what yes, I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll 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 leave verse ten. Not that we're afraid of verse ten, but we'll leave verse ten alone. But look at verse number eleven. He says, "My father laid a heavy laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions." So he's really just like beating his chest, right? So what is There's that? Jeffrey, Jeffrey from the, uh, the Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's a good, that is a good analogy. He is Joffrey from King of Thrones. What happened to old Joffrey at uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Game of Thrones? <laughs> he got worse and worse to control people and make the people just use as a you know, toy or something. But he's... Yeah. They end up poisoning him, right? <laughs> poisoning him. Yeah, the, at the end, yeah, he was poisoning him. Right. <laughs> Right. I still think Ramsey was worse, but we won't get into all that. Okay. We won't get into all that. Anyways. Uh, so do you see how Rehoboam, you see this, the, the mistakes as a leader he's making, right? He rejected the advice of Solomon's advisor, advisors, right? He surrounded himself. Look what it says. He said he took advice from with, the, with, with young men who had grown up with and were serving him. Those people didn't have the people's best interests at heart. They had their best interests at heart because they want to be close to the king because being close to the king has his benefits, right? So then what does he do? What does he do? He says, he tell, he says, man, tell them people, they, I'm going to work them even harder. There's an um, old army infantry field manual that says, you are not the leader until this, until your leadership is ascribed on the hearts of your people. And basically what it's saying is you're not a leader until the people make you their leader. Do you get what I'm saying? Until the people are willing to, to lead you and to follow, to follow you and do what you say. And you earn that a lot of times by people understanding that you're going to take care of them, right? People are more willing to be up under your leadership if they know you have their best interests at heart. But those of you who are, who are married, right? Uh, your, you try to have your spouse's best interests at heart, right? I hope so. <laughs> try. Huh? You try? try. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So, Carter, you ain't saying that. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm looking, sir. <laughs> I'm not okay <laughs> but yeah my leader hadn't given me permission to speak i get it i get it brother carter it's all right <laughs> but the point i'm trying to make overall is you see the mistakes he's already making very very early in his leadership right because some people will say oh he shouldn't do that he's they, they're going to take advantage of him and this that and the other no, take care of your people. They will take care of you. All right, let's, let's, I think this is it. Let's close it out. Somebody read for us uh, verses 12 through 17. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly rejecting the advice given to him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young man and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with, the whip, with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord has spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat through ah, Ahijah, Ahijah, the Shilonite. Verse 16, when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part of Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel, look <laughs> after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the town of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. All right. Now, 
for those of you who are Bible scholars, you know that uh, the Lord had already said he was going to take the kingdom. He was going to split the kingdom um, after Solomon died. Okay. So mm -hmm. we can go ahead and go through that. So some people might say, well, this is already, you know, faded. Could be. Um, but as if we look at Jonah, God can change his mind, right? Um, so, but he lost, I think, I think that if, if I remember correctly, the tribes of Israel are every uh, other 10 tribes besides Judah and Benjamin, if I'm not mistaken. So those tribes went off, went up, you know, went off and started the, the, the kingdom of Israel. And then there was the kingdom of Judah. So he ended up losing more because he wanted to rule with the iron fist. Right. So Rehoboam teaches us that we have to, I mean, that, so that bad leadership costs We've definitely seen this in the church. When you, when the churches have experienced bad leadership, we have seen people leave. And let me tell you a little secret. They're not coming back anymore. This is not the old days where they would hide out until a new pastor come in and they come back. Once folks leave now, they're not coming back. They'll go to the Baptist church down the street. The, the, I, I tell people this, and it sounds weird. There's no brand loyalty anymore, right? They don't care that we're AME Zion. I think there's like, how many AME churches are in are in uh are in the area, right? So we have to be mindful, especially in the church, of how our leadership affects overall. Because especially those of us who are preachers and pastors, what does Jesus say about doing something to one of his little ones? I do believe he says, tie a millstone around your neck and jump into the deepest part of the ocean if you were to hurt one of my little ones. I take that quite seriously. The church is considered the bride of Christ. Now, I don't know too many people going to let somebody abuse their spouse. Okay? So what I'm trying to lift up for us today, this evening, is um, we, can, we have to be careful about our leadership. All right, got a question for you. What can you actually learn from bad leadership? What not to do? That's a good one. <laughs> so even if you're under bad leadership, take lessons and say, okay, I see what they did. I'm not going to do that. Bad mm -hmm. leadership a lot of times can teach you what to avoid, okay? So be mm -hmm. mindful, uh, even under bad leadership, there's still stuff that you can learn, even learn what not to do. Um, I know some people were saying, I've heard people say they didn't want to get premarital counseling from somebody who's been divorced. And I said, actually, that might be the best person to talk to. And they can definitely tell you what not to do. <laughs> they might not know how to make it work. And you might, you know, you might question them about making it work, but they can definitely tell you, hey, don't do, don't do what I did, right? Avoid X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, I, I think you need to leave that brother and sister alone because <laughs> they may not learn their lesson too well. You know what? Touche. Hopefully they <laughs> learned their lesson and can at least tell you what not to do. And they hope they ain't like, what's well, all her, you know, it's all their fault. Like, no, you know, it's their well, fault. Well, I, I told my nephew the other day, mm -hmm. don't take advice from two people. Don't take advice from somebody ain't got nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and don't take advice from somebody who had somebody. That is some very good advice. That is very good advice. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Uh, like I said, going back to it, shows people what kind of leaders they are. Show I mean, shows what kind of leaders, what kind of people we are. Um, bad leadership teaches us lessons. It ignites our desire for God's reign, and it it shows us the difference between God's leadership and man's leadership. Right. So there's some stuff we can actually glean from bad leadership. All right, any questions, comments, concerns? Hopefully you got something out of this um, tonight. I did, I did. I did. Thank you, Pastor. All right. Um, so let me say this. The reason why I kind of wanted to do this lesson on leadership is because 
I feel like it's one of the major things that's hindering our growth, not just, I'm, I'm talking about the collective hours, AME Zion hours, the church's hours, not necessarily St. Mark's hours, growth. We, we need to know what good leadership looks like for one. And we need to hold people accountable. Now it might not always happen, I get that. Um, we, we all have heard of examples of bad leaders who just keep getting pushed on up because, you know, they first cousins with the right people. But, mm. <laughs> you know, but we also need to under, but also I feel like my job as the pastor here is to grow up good leaders. Because if I invest and grow up good leaders here at St. Mark, it does nothing but bless St. Mark going forward, right? And so we have to be mindful of leadership. Um, I would advise you, if you can, to read some books on leadership um, and figure out ways to improve your leadership. Um, leadership is something you, because there's always a debate, is leadership something natural or is it something learned? I do, be, I do believe there's some people who are innate, have natural leadership skills, right? But I also believe you can learn basic principles to make you at least a functional leader. I, find, I think it's the same way with uh, preaching. Some people are just naturally gifted at it. But I do think that you can read, learn, and get skills to be an effective preacher. You get what I'm saying? Amen. Um, I don't think it's a, I don't think it, you know, some people we think we look at some people like, oh, they're just naturally talented. No, um, most of the time what that is, is natural talent. Yes, but a lot of hard work too. And so as we even we're thinking about going forward, we need to be concentrating on our leadership. Are we being effective leaders? Are we do being good servant leaders and understand leadership is not just the preachers, but lay leaders. How am I leading the missionaries? How am I leading the men of Zion? How am I leading the class leaders? How am I leading my class? Leadership is that important. It needs, it has to go all the way down. All right. Any other questions, comments, discussions? No, I thought this lesson y'all would be more talkative, but it's fine. <laughs> all right. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for being on. Um, Reverend Rako Brown will be with us next week. And she told me the title, but I forgot. Help me out, Reverend Rako. Uh, the Recovery of Faith. Uh, okay. I would like to talk with, you know, um, the recovery, when we are in a somewhat recovery process, uh, right. how someone's testimony, your testimony, how your faith, Maybe, of course, I want to focus on some Bible text, but uh, how your faith help you to back to the normal. So, um, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a really good one. Um, and I might have to share some principles with uh, some people from that, being that, as y'all know, I've been to two funerals back to back. So mm -hmm. I know some people that are um, recovering. I've been trying to check on my daughter's mom. Um, pretty regularly because like I tell people uh, you have so many people around you when the funeral's going but who looks who reaches out to you after it's over you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're trying to get back into that new normal of not having that person around so we want to uh, definitely that's definitely a good 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 subject all right everyone uh, thank you guys for being on thank you for participating um uh, we're going to continue doing this. Uh, we're going to make some announcement to all, um, here soon about some change, some things we got planned for uh, Lent. Um, Lenten season is upon us. Uh, we will uh, Lent starts February seventeenth, and so uh, we want to keep that in mind. Uh, we are going to do a fast for Lent. Um, we're not doing the Daniel fast because some of y'all systems already change over to the Daniel fast because you do it so long <laughs> for uh, for Lent. Um, the fast we're going to employ is a midnight to noon fast. OK, now let me say this. If you have some kind of medical condition, please eat and find something else to fast from. OK, do not harm yourself <laughs> trying to do this fast. 
I know the one time I've done this, we had this lady, she's about to black out. And she was like, well, I'm just trying to fast past. I was like, listen, if you can't do it because you need to eat to take medication or you need to eat for, you know, certain reasons, do that. But for those of us who can do this fast safely, that's the fast we'll be doing. Um, I remember the first time I did this, I was in Alaska and a young man, and one of the guys there was like, man, pastor, this fast been hard. He was like, oh, I don't even eat breakfast, but now all I think about is breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we died. But midnight to noon, I know me and the wife last year, we gave up meat for Lent, which was interesting. Um, so it's supposed to be challenging. It's not supposed to be something that's easy. And remember, when you're fasting, you're not sitting around dreaming about when the next time you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to be praying, reflecting on God's word, doing that kind of stuff, okay? All right. Any other questions, comments? None? All right. All right, y'all. I want to thank you guys for being on. My wife has made thank you, some... I saw thank that. Thank you uh -huh. coming on. Yeah, my wife has made some kind of stew and I'm hungry, so I'm about to go eat. <laughs> but let us uh hey sister green i see you all here how you doing i'm doing fine good good thank you guys for being on thank you for your participation uh let's uh close out with prayer i'll turn this off well they can hear the prayer right. let us pray dear god our father we thank you for this study God, we want to be good leaders of those you have placed under our care, God. We want to lead them as you your, as you would lead us or as your son led us, God, or as the spirit leads us, Father. We just want to be, uh, we want to do what's in your sight. We want to be good servant leaders as we're serving them so they can serve the world. And Father, we're just asking as we get off this conference, as we get off this um, Zoom call, that um, any places of leadership where we're falling short, we ask that you expose them to us and help us to grow. God, we're asking that you put somebody in our life that will hold us accountable and push us to be all that we can be. God, we understand that we can't grow unless we do this thing together. And so, Father, we're just asking right now that you bless every household represented here, that you bless all, all the members, and that you continue to be with us as we go forward. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Pastor.